Welcome to the Pain Education Podcast. My name is Alex Corey, and as always, I'm joined by Bill Paravano. This podcast is brought to you by the Camella Foundation. Our mission at the Camella Foundation is to relieve pain naturally using osteopathic healing principles. Join us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time Live with your questions where we'll be going into detail on how the underlying patterns in your neurology are affecting pain and tension in your physical body. How are you doing today, Bill? Good, Alex. How are you doing? Good. It is January 17th and still feels like we are on the rocket ship leaving orbit. <laughs> oh, January 17th, 2023. Yes. Yeah. Um, we are actually in the same location today. I apologize for the tardiness, everyone, but setting up film gear in, in a new location. We're at the basement of Sovereignty Labs today, so I don't have internet in my usual location. Today we're going over inflammation, uh, the neurology around inflammation, some of the biochemical aspects of it from my side, and then thinking about different, being non-dogmatic, about pain reduction because I see, and I do this plenty too, is the same thing people do with nutrition is whatever worked for them is then the only thing that works. So obviously it's meeting someone where they are, like you always say, and, and using every available tool possible for pain reduction, not, not having to be stuck in one, one lane, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Where would you like to start? Well, I would like to qualify that yes, statement please. before we get in there is there's there's a balance yeah. that needs to happen between being non-dogmatic mm -hmm. and then not having any reference point. Because some people will get, uh, I'll try this and I'll try this and I'll try this and I'll try this. And they have no reference point if anything they're doing is working. And what they're doing, they, they don't have a connection between what they did that worked and the results that they're getting. So there has to be a balance between the two in order to get some sort of idea mm -hmm. that you're moving forward. Like your, your situation is improving yes. as a result of the, the um, healing modality mm -hmm. or the uh, dietary approach or the inflammation reduction approach that you're using. And for the reference point, last week we spoke about the paramount of getting back into a parasympathetic state, sort of just to become aware of, of where the starting point is, where you're as close to baseline as possible is. Would you consider that a, a good reference point to start from? in a way, but we got to qualify reference point because a lot of people's reference point is there, it's already amped up and they don't have a sense of who they are and what a, um, they, with everything we're bombarded with in society, our systems are constantly exposed to sympathetic stimulus, you know, just do it. No pain, no gain. Pain mm -hmm. is weakness leaving the body. What they see in an email or on a phone call or on the internet or whatever it is, it's all about getting your neurology excited. And when there is, and, and I see it, is there is an addiction to that sympathetic nervous system state that people don't realize how amped up they are on a baseline. I'll give you a perfect for instance, is I had a client that I was working with in person this past week. And this is the second week in a row. She has knee pain. Uh, her knees are starting to feel better. She's walking longer distances. And I was working on her and she actually dropped down enough where she fell asleep. So I have an email that goes out the day after our appointment to give me some feedback as to how it went. She was upset that she fell asleep during the session. So there's, it's like 
there's this place where it's not okay to be in that parasympathetic state. Mm -hmm. And this is, it, it's like, I know we, our intro to this was to talk about inflammation. Yes. However, we, sometimes we got to get really present as to what we're dealing with. Otherwise we'll never get to address the inflammation. Many people want to start on that diet, get the diet going. I want to start working with a coach and all of mm -hmm. that. Their nervous system is so jacked up. They're not even in a place ready to be able to work with the coach. They're not in a place to discipline themselves to drink the water because they're not even confident that the water is going to make a difference in how it's going to uh, change in their body, how it feels. They don't eat. It's like we got to establish the baseline yes. that um, we've been working on at Sovereignty Lab was actually working with uh, a neurological um, dropping the neurology down to get it into a parasympathetic state on a baseline that they can do a specific series of um, a combination of EFT, like a tapping as well as an affirmation, and we can certainly insert that into the video as a way of something they would do a, a two or three times a day to drop their nervous system on a regular basis that would actually prepare them to a place to be able to be helped. Because yes. when you're in a sympathetic state, we aren't even thinking clearly. We're fight or flight. We're just trying to survive. And when we hear input from a coach or somebody we want to work with or somebody that's willing to help us, mm -hmm. we don't even feel like we could trust them. Right. So they they start working with a coach and immediately. It's like, ah, it isn't working. And then the next week they're out. So they can't, they aren't even establishing a baseline because the neurology is so amped up. Right. And this is almost the prerequisite to the course for right. for the course to even hit or be relevant to you at all for anything to land. The prerequisites to taking would be amping your neurology down. And name your course. Right. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Dietary course, uh, self-help course, uh, working with a practitioner with body work. I hear that a lot mm -hmm. with people in the... Um, in the uh, alternative health, uh, whoever, name it, acupuncture, homeopathy, massage. You, how do you build your client base? Well, you can't build your client base if people are so amped up, they can't even relax enough to stay with you to see any long lasting changes. Right. And I think that just points to the, the, how much the nervous system is just so uh, jacked up all the time. Yes. And the nice thing about, or the nice thing about the, um, I don't even want to say dietary frameworks, the nutrition principles I work with is it's almost not dietary principles, but it's exactly what you said. It's getting rid of the inflammation first, and then it almost doesn't matter because if it's not inflammatory, then you're body is able to effectively utilize it. So you're getting rid of the, uh, the nervous system response first, and then you can start playing with things. So that, that, ta that tracks. I, and I'd even challenge you that a lot of people that this would go back to, you start, you start taking things out of a person's diet. Mm -hmm. That is kind of a comfort food. Yes. If your neurology amped up you start removing that from their diet, it's going to feel like the client that fell asleep on the table. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, what are you doing? Yep. So, so it, we have, it, it's like there's this either a half a step before or an A that's being missed or step one that's being missed in this process. And that is looking at the neurology first. How can we get the neurology down I almost think like it, it should be like a free course <laughs> or a free thing. I, and I know uh, Christina and I had been putting that together in terms of the, the simple EFT affirmation. Kind Can of you explain EFT? 
because I, I know what it is, but that, that might be a new term for most people. EFT is like um, emotional freedom technique. Uh, and I'm not an expert on it. I just yeah. know from my personal experience that there are these uh, little voices in our head that's tied with our neurology belief systems that we have going underneath the hood, <laughs> so to speak, that tell us we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're too uh, big, we're too skinny, we're not uh, strong enough, we're not fast enough, whatever it is that we are not enough that keeps us on in the state of angst almost on a consistent and a regular basis. And if we can begin to back that off just a tiny bit so this isn't screaming so loud, right. then we can get the neurology to relax enough that we can make progress. It's like uh, revving, revving the engine when we're spinning in mud. Right. Like it, Ooh, like wheels that. aren't getting any traction to move forward. And I think this is what happens with anyone name it, whatever, uh, trying to reduce inflammation, trying to go on a diet, trying to start exercising, New Year's resolutions, whatever that is, going to the gym, uh, they they aren't able to get that level of traction yep. because of they're not present with what's going on with their neurology. They're just trying to stack it on top of an underlying already running record so to speak, not starting at the true foundation. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. So w what would be the, the half step, the baby step? Um, EFT is one technique. Anything else that you would say in order to even become aware of where you're trying to get back down to an idol, so to speak, opposed to revving your engine? Breathing techniques are really mm -hmm breathing yeah. any specific ones or just breathing in general and, and paying attention to breath being aware of your breath many people are holding their breath unconsciously or subconsciously on a daily basis um, you're just getting up and out of a chair in and out of bed uh, going up and down stairs people hold their breath they go to bend over to pick up a kleenex they're holding their breath and starting to become more uh, present mindful and uh, aware of that, that the, the physical movement needs to be separate from the breath. Most of it is like tied to the breath. You even see guys at the gym when they bench press, yeah. you know, yeah. and, they, and they blow it out. And what ends up happening is it creates an entrainment mm. in the neurology that when they move a certain way, their breath is tied to that movement. Well, this creates an unnatural tension pattern in the neurology that happens unconsciously, subconsciously. They don't even realize that it's happening. Um, right. Yeah. So yoga, uh, certain ways of stretching and um, breathing. They're only exhaling in a certain way or only inhaling a certain way. It creates an unnatural tension pattern in the neurology. And obviously, one of the biggest changes, diaphragm breathing opposed to upper chest breathing. So I track immediately whenever I feel anxiety hitting for myself, and I've had a, a history of that. I'm better at watching it now, but the breath immediately comes up, shallow breaths through the, through the chest opposed to deep belly breaths, which are, are more relaxing. Uh, if someone hasn't had a history of awareness regarding that, how would you tune into where your breath is coming from for the first time? Can you just take five minutes and actually sort of try to feel your diaphragm expanding? Because if you've been, a if you've been up here your entire life, it would feel very odd to almost try to push your, your breath down into your diaphragm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, like belly breath, like Yes. When you inhale and your belly pushes out. A lot of people feel really uncomfortable with that. Right. Because there's a social stigma around having a belly push out. Right. Considered fat. 
or, <laughs> you know, or yep. whether it has any relationship with it being the person is actually overweight, it can still be um, perceived or the person has a social stigma around the, the belly being relaxed. Mm. I have a, a, maybe a different uh, neurology based way to reframe that. It, are there certain positions that are helpful to get your obviously comfortable positions, but are there any that you know of to help someone move breath back down into the belly more so, or does that come with amping down your neurology first? Well, this is coming from martial arts training. Sure. May not, it may be questionable, but if you had someone sit on your chest, mm, yeah, okay. <laughs> you'd, be forced, you'd be forced to breathe down into your belly because you can't expand your chest. And that's where I think we get into this um, too uh, passive. Mm. Of, okay, I'm just going to relax and I'm going to try to breathe down into my belly. And a lot of times, unless we, we need both that um, direct and indirect, we talked about that in previous yes. podcasts, that um, we need both a masculine and feminine approach to get the body to move forward. Sometimes we need the body to be supported and um, listened to and heard, like all of that kind of good uh, buzzwords that yes. nowadays, but there's, I think there's a, a, a direct or a masculine approach that brought to the table can really move the body forward and fast forward faster because it, it, the neurology is tricky. Mm -hmm. Trauma is tricky. Um, it, it's like, um, it'll play whack-a-mole with you. Like if we just do it from a, a feminine perspective or a, a passive perspective, indirect perspective, the neurology can play this little game where things don't really change. It seems like it's changing, but in actuality, you're in the very same spot you were when you started. Right. And that's where um, when you have uh, a direct or... Um, a masculine approach, it can put the finger on the thing that needs to be shifted for you to mm -hmm. look at. And you have the opportunity for that to shift. So if you have the, um, the, oh what's the, what's the wording that would be, it's it's like a in, in internal strength mm. to look at it and i think in society today we were too easy to coddle the trauma and allow people to wallow in their own self pity of the trauma without moving the body forward it's not to say the People don't need to be supported in what's happened to them, but at some point you got to go, okay, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to move forward through this, whatever difficult situation. And um, I think that's a balanced approach. Right. We're, we're kind of leaving out one end of the conversation. That needs yes. Yeah. Their forward momentum is, is crucial. Um, getting back to, inflammation so those were strategies used to slowly return yourself to a more parasympathetic state how does the inflammation how would you be able to tell other than someone obviously being in pain mm -hmm. what techniques or just awareness have you developed for spotting inflammation in yourself i can feel it like I, it's like Where? a feeling. I, um, my whole body, like mm. things just feel um, uh, swollen. I was going to say, is it heat? 
Is it stagnation? Is it like puffiness? Is it vibration? What do you notice? Puffiness, a lethargy. Um, mm. it, it, I always equate it to, and this is, this happened when I was a teenager in, into my early twenties. If I sat down and I ate a huge plate of pasta, yeah, how I would feel after I ate a, a huge plate of pasta, there's that, oh, I feel like I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. I feel swollen. Like the, the snake that just ate the. Oh, yeah. I'm well aware. I did the right. same thing. You yeah. know, and you, you want to lay there until it passes, until yes. the food digests. As opposed to if I had uh, a steak or if I had just um, uh, a protein dish, right? there's a, a lean feeling or a, more of a, it's just a different feeling. That, that's the way I can equate it to what it feels like when you're inflamed and when you're not. And the more you eat the stuff that gives you that feeling like you ate that bowl of pasta or that big plate of pasta, that creates this lethargy, the brain fog, the digestion slowing down, like all of it is right there. Yes. That's how I would equate my experience of inflammation. Brain fog is a good way to put that. Most people will resonate with that, just that almost like misfiring on cylinders. You're like, I should be able to think about this and grasp this or be more fluid in speech quicker. Like there's a noticeable difference between the way you feel when you didn't just do that and your cognition and all that opposed to right after something that was highly inflammatory. I think that'll, that'll resonate. Yeah. For me, it's, um, brain fog. Definitely my body will physically heat up. So I'm obnoxiously aware of my normal temperature and it'll feel like I'm going through a workout, like a low grade workout. If I eat something that is inflammatory, Mm -hmm. it'll feel um, like my forehead will just get warm and I'll be like, that's not good. (laughs) Well, well, I know you, you've spoken about how your metabolism is real hot. And I almost kind of equate it to when when I think about your description of your metabolism being real high and you put something like that strictly carbohydrates into your system, especially uh, the type of carbohydrates like sugar, pasta, refined foods like that. It's like putting gas on a fire. Yeah. It's going to, body's going to torch it real quick and it yes. would, would make sense you'd heat up like that yeah if i go 72 miles an hour for a highway analogy normally which probably is a little i mean i'm i have various strategies to to ramp that down but say that's about the average it feels like you kick it up to 85 like the engine has a noticeable yeah. uh you can hear it and feel it revving basically mm-hmm. it's not necessarily a good feeling but that's my internal uh, other than like joint pain, muscle pain, achiness, like the traditional things people would think of with inflammation. But sometimes it's not so obvious. Like a lot of the times with with subtle forms of inflammation, redness, or um, I always think of like knee pain or things that trigger things that are right on the other side of the threshold, mm-hmm. so to speak, from from your, even if you're nowhere near baseline, if you're up at like 75%, things you start noticing whenever you push it just to 80%, mm-hmm. so to speak. Do you have any um, any clients that you've dealt with that have very subtle forms of inflammation where they're like, I noticed that this happens, like not so obvious over the top things? I think it the flexibility in their joints Mm. lack of flexibility in their joints. It'll feel a little bit more difficult to move in different ranges of motion. And I think that begins to compound over time. A lot of people, um, when they're looking at, um, arthritis 
in their joints, uh, bone on bone, mm. uh, herniated discs in their neck and their back. I think this is a chronic inflammatory state that's been there for an extended period of time Yeah, that they didn't know what to do with because they didn't even realize the irritation in their neurology was up higher than normal. And now they're dealing with this. Um, uh, they've gotten into the routine of the food that they eat and their exercise level, and they don't have a good exercise level, meaning it's not that much. Right. <laughs> and it creates these conditions where the joints begin to degenerate. Uh, there's a level of dehydration that takes place on a, base, on a baseline level. And um, I, I know you do all the water thing. Have mm -hmm. you ever talked about the allocation of water in the body and what the body does? Um, oh, I mean, it's used for literally every critical process. So by, by molecular count, we are 99% water. By physical volume, we're 66% water. Mm -hmm. And that's that's baseline i i don't think most people are dehydrated mm. thirst is not a good indicator for hydration level because thirst right. is a yeah that's a, a too far gone or usually people notice that whenever they're active if they go from just being um, more sedentary or in their normal rhythm to more active they will notice their body crushing minerals and water and that's the other side of hydration it's not really the other side but minerals are becoming more talked about now thankfully as 50 percent of hydration is is a uh, mineralization and so one thing that people notice whenever they just start drinking more water the water that i use is uh, has extra molecular hydrogen in it which is a potent antioxidant mm -hmm. so there's other cascading effects but as for inflammation and and the neurology side of it, <clears throat> probably one of the fastest ways I can think about that doesn't take any extra mental effort, there's no barrier, is just drink more water. Not juice, mm -hmm. not, not water-based beverages, but just mineral water. It's so clean mm -hmm. mineral water. And see what goes away that, like you were saying, that you wouldn't have thought would be tied to a state of just over the threshold inflammation, joint pain, like you said, lethargy, brain fog, all of those smoldering chronic inflammatory issues that we would measure on like a metabolic panel. You look at C-reactive protein. You can look at a couple of your inflammatory cytokines. If you ever have blood work done, there's a couple of things on there that people look at for general proxies of inflammation and the very cool thing is water is kind of the foundation that I will use for, uh, I mean, if I'm feeling lethargic or it's just been a, a longer day than I thought it was where, you know, you weren't doing anything over the top, you weren't doing manual labor, but um, if water makes you feel better and mm -hmm. it'll happen quickly, especially if you're not on a full stomach and it's not getting diluted, then there's a, a general sense of chronic inflammation going on there. Yeah, your joints aren't as lubricated as they could have been. Mm -hmm. uh, blood viscosity changes pretty quickly. All sorts of nuanced things, nutrient transport, nutrient absorption. Like it's the, it makes everything work better. Mm -hmm. Your blood is water soluble and your body works in terms of H3O2. So whole different conversation with, with structuring there, but, um, yeah, if, if you're trying to get, that's what I've been using, actually, since we've been doing this, is if I'm feeling amped up, mm -hmm. I've been more tuned and more aware of the different gradients of that threshold. But the first thing I will do if I need to bring myself back into a more parasympathetic, into a more baseline state, is just drink more water. I won't chug mm -hmm. it. Uh, the literature is kind of weird on this, where it seems to be your body appreciates about eight ounces at a time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a, that's a large amount for your body. That's not a small one. It doesn't seem like a large amount when you're drinking it. That's a small glass. Mm -hmm. Just that amount will not trigger a digestion response and allows for uh, rapid absorption. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been my go-to with 
any of the inflammatory states is water first. Yep. And, and what you're talking about is um, ta tangential. Yes. The, the direction that I'm coming from. When a person is dealing with uh, arthritis, yep. and this is very interesting, arthritis is diagnosed as dehydrated joint. Is uh, it? It is, yeah. Wow. So, so this is interesting. So arthritis is diagnosed as dehydrated joints. So the joints begin to dehydrate. And the body goes through this process of a hierarchy of water allocation when we get progressively yep. more dehydrated. And the body will go to, it, it needs to keep the brain the blood and the organs right. as a, as a hierarchy. So it's, it's higher on the totem pole in terms of keeping the body alive. If it doesn't keep the body alive, you have a stroke, you have a heart attack, um, because the blood clots, you don't drink enough water. Uh, it doesn't have enough to keep things functioning properly. So, what happens is when the body doesn't have enough water, it goes to the bones and the synovial fluid in the joints yeah. and robs the water from those areas to keep the brain, the blood, and the organs working properly. And minerals. Right. Exactly. So what ends up happening is it dehydrates the joints. Interesting. So now you have people that are running around with arthritis. They get diagnosed with arthritis because their joints are aching. <clears throat> excuse me and they're well they get a, on a prescription or something they go to the doctor and they're diagnosed with arthritis and what they need to do and the, and they're told they need to use it or lose it so they mm -hmm. exercise more with this lack of water going on in their body which dehydrates the joint worse and makes the joint achier so we have the neurology that when the water allocation decreases, you had mentioned it before, you feel you get in more of a sympathetic yeah. neurological state because the body's dehydrated. Yeah. So you go back and you exercise in this dehydrated mm. state. You further amp up your neurology without truly understanding the pattern that's going on in your physical body. The body is not like we are led it to believe. Your body is what is known as a tensegrity structure. You're familiar with R. Buckminster Fuller? Uh, yes, but that term is new to me. Tensegrity structure. It's systems theory. That your body's an interconnected series of pulleys and levers. Mm. I, it, I mean, it, it's like a sail, a sailboat or a geodesic dome or a bicycle wheel. That if you take the bicycle wheel, you have the tension between the rim and the hub and the spokes. And as long as there's a balance in that tension, right. that bicycle wheel can hold a tremendous amount of weight. But the moment you start messing with the spokes, right. then that bicycle wheel gets a little lopsided and it doesn't it's not true it's not spinning smoothly yes uh, the it's more easier for the tire to blow out because of the imbalance in there it, so it has this cascade effect that causes the bicycle tire to wear unevenly to blow out all sorts of issues same thing with a sail on a boat if the on a sailboat, if the tension in the sail isn't proper and the sail is flapping, it's more likely to be ripped. The body works the very same way. The body is a tensegrity structure, which is why if you stub your toe, the rest of the body compensates right. for the stub toe and it creates an imbalance in the tensegrity structure. Well, when your body is dehydrated, the joints begin to collapse. It affects the tensegrity structure. And you can go ahead and you can drink water to try to rehydrate the joint that you know is dehydrated and diagnosed with arthritis. 
But if you don't address the tension that developed in the neurology before, mm -hmm. then what ends up happening is the joint can't expand enough to get the water in to rehydrate the joint. Because it's protecting itself a little bit? You have a neurological tension pattern stuck in the neurology keeping the joint tensed up. The joint tenses up to protect itself because of the pain that it feels. And it tenses up to diffuse the tension so it doesn't feel the amount of pain it would mm. feel if the joint wasn't tense. Like, I mean, there's layers on this. And yeah. when, and, and here's where you and I will differ on things. When we look at the literature, it's not going to talk about all of these dynamic components, how the body functions. Right. And if we only look at it through um, a, a double blind study uh, peer reviewed, we're not going to get the whole picture and the body's still going to be in pain. Yes. So, <laughs> and this, this is where you have to test. Mm hmm neurology drop down and you have to type, drink more water, see what happens and see how the body responds. And, and, and everything you're bringing to the table is absolutely valid and great right. stuff. We just need to look both at the, the map mm -hmm. and look at the territory. Like where yes. are we? <laughs> both model and reality. At, yeah. At the same time. Right. Cause there are some things that, uh, I will, in working with clients, it's like, oh, uh, I discovered this. And all of a sudden, then I see some sort of study that was done that reinforces what I found out as a result of working hands-on with clients. Yeah, there's a good phrase, which is pursue results, reinforce with science. So sure. that's right. It's you have to get out of pain first. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter what the literature says should work. It's what works. Right. And, and that's where the piece is. If you start out with, well, prove to me that it's going to work. Right. Well, we'll never get there. You'll never get out of pain. If I got to prove to you, you're going to get out of pain before we ever start. So Probably. Then the amount of literature, in my experience, the amount of data that has to be collected and the amount of studies that need to be aggregated for people mm -hmm. to accept something without trying it themselves takes 10 years-ish. As mm -hmm. in, if you wait or if you make yourself wait for something, for everyone to agree that something works. I mean, you're gonna be waiting for a while. So if you're in pain, right, it is find small steps that dial your pain back. I wouldn't wait for, for 10 years of literature to come out before you start anything. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that doesn't make sense. Oh, we were going to, um, this week, I know we're working on creating the systems and the structure for yes. this podcast. So if there's people that have questions, that wanna ask questions for you or for oh, me, yeah. I've been looking at comments and it was um, back when we started, about 10 minutes after we started, uh, first thing someone did for their clients after, I believe we were talking about um, just yeah. amping them down on the neurology before they actually started any modality. Yeah. And uh, also um, we want to get, uh, let's see. What is, what is your uh, website? Cultivated-change.com. Yeah, everyone, uh, uh, excuse the, for the, our audio listeners. We are still getting our flow going for for our live stream. So thank you for bearing with us. Yeah, no, I mean, this is this is kind of the, uh, the process. Yeah, it is the process. You and I both go through and it, it's we're modeling yep. for those that are watching in or listening that, you know, it's like if we would have got everything perfect before we started, we never would have started. Yeah, exactly. It, it just takes, well, you always have to start, right? I think in every, every single modality of doing anything, making any sort of change, which is what my other podcast is about cultivating change. It is always, just start. The archetype is 
I believe you are the fool before you are the savior. So it's always start poorly and just start, and then you will get progressively better, wiser through application and turn that into wisdom. But I, I love that archetype, which is the savior always starts as the fool or the jester. Oh yeah. Yep. Make a lot of stumbles along the way. And you know what I think there's this, uh, the, the people who make the mistakes are seen at, we kind of have this idea that we're supposed to be perfect. Yeah. So we're judged by society as if we make mistakes, mm -hmm. we aren't able to course correct. Right. And, and you see that a lot in society that we're constantly um, pivoting, shifting, changing uh, every day. We're constantly evolving and allowing that to happen for mm -hmm. ourselves and for other people around us. Uh, this is something with the neurology that I've been really learning within the past six months to nine months is allowing other people. I would mentally hold them in a place mm. that wouldn't allow them to show up differently. I still expected them to, if they screwed up or in my mind, whatever they did was right. incorrect, that if I held them in that place, place next time they showed up i was like expecting them you know it was uh, like subconsciously just yes. looking for them to do that there was a fascinating i think it was a joe dispenza quote that i heard just an audio snippet and it kind of broke my brain for a minute which was trust the like character of trust is actually a slightly twisted form of false expectation. So when you say you trust someone, what some people imply is that you are um, trusting that they, you're expecting that they act the same way they have. It's kind of a, a, a reliable prediction mechanism. And sometimes you don't allow them to show up as their present, potentially different self. And I was like, ooh, that one hurts. Because it, you know, trust is one of those fundamental core relationship things. And, but it was accurate. It was, I always hold, you know, a pigeonholed version of someone. I know someone based off of this version of themselves and I trust them to act like that. But yeah, expectations of how someone else should show up is a weird concept. And allowing people to change is, is hard. It, and here, here's the other side of that spectrum. Yes. Is that a lot of people are not very self-monitoring, right? And they'll allow themselves. And we were talking about this with uh, Rob the other day. Yes. Uh, we'll have to plug Rob's chocolate thing. <laughs> but, um, you know, people not drawing boundaries with people, uh, they they allow their neurology to be complacent ah yes and what ends up happening is they continue to show up in that small space having a uh, little to no expectations of themselves to improve or get better and then you're carrying dead weight right so you know there there's a there's a balance between that two well, how can i um honor and respect my own boundaries and then support people where they're at. And I, I found that I, I tend to watch more mm -hmm. see how people show up, allow them to be who they are, whatever that, is, whatever that is. And they could show up either powerfully or they could show up like a, a bump on a log. And mm -hmm. I don't have to say anything to either of them. I engage differently. Right. On how they show up. That's a great way to phrase that. Yeah, well, you, correct. And I always watch actions, so I, I don't necessarily care so much what people say at this point is, yeah, actions are everything, and it's a really good way to meet people where they are. And someone just put up a good question. I'll get that. I got it. I got it. Okay. Okay. Oh, and is there a way they can log in? Isn't there something that they got to log in so we can see their name? It's okay. But anyways, in my modality, we call it introducing my skeleton to their skeleton. We use the manubrium 
and C7 T1 bones to drop the fight or flight response, which relaxes the client to better find their own comfort position. And I agree to an extent. Like you can, just like I did, I was talking about the client at the beginning, you can drop their neurology, but if they're not okay, if they have some story in their head that's not okay with being that relaxed, um, there is that autonomic flexibility we've talked about in the first two podcasts that their their nervous system has has gotten too relaxed and they're not okay with that. So what will happen is they'll come to out of that and they'll jump right into doing the thing that got them to the place on the table to begin with. What is the manubrium, if I may ask? Uh, I don't know where I have to. Or just overview. Is it a, just a skeletal bone or a, a backbone? Somebody knows uh, part of the anatomy that I have. Hold on a second. Sure. Uh, it's kind of like above the sternum. Oh, that would be where I thought. Okay. Yes. Some anatomy. How about that? So it, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, the breastbone right there. Yes. Right around in there. Use that bone and C seven T one to drop. Yeah, so the sympathetic response. Okay, sure. so they're touching here at the manubrium. They're also touching in the back at C seven T one, which kind of gives like a supportive feeling to the to the body. Is that a bundle of of nerves that has direct correlation? Well, I guess uh, what is the modality? I'm not familiar that specific modality that could be different things uh, so if that face if the facebook user <laughs> can share the specific modality that they're referring to that would give us a little bit more of a reference point mm -hmm. I'm interested in it. what were you speaking about right before that i don't remember okay <laughs> we'll have to play the replay um while we're waiting for that response uncomfortable silence yes what we talk about next so, trying well, to i have plenty of different things before. what does <clears throat> i'm still curious about eft and the tapping why does the emotional freedom technique and the tapping bring you back into a more parasympathetic state what does the tapping do because i've seen this in multiple places i'm very curious what that does i'm not, well i understand what it does and i think there's a reprogramming mm. of the neurology that can take place uh, that doesn't impose on the neurology in a way kind of like a software update mm -hmm. in a in a phone or a right. computer i think that's what um, can be engaged with the with EFT with tapping. Um, I'm not clear on the mechanism that how that works. However, other I'm, than just giving your body something to pay attention to almost like a subconscious or unconscious reprogramming where you're directing yep. your yep. locus of focus is shifting, kind of like making your body pay attention almost. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. I, I mean, I, there were, the, I work with a woman, she's actually affiliated with the Camella Foundation, mm -hmm. Jeannie Anderson out of Pennsylvania. Um, she is, I interviewed her on one of the previous podcasts and she's brilliant because she's able to do remote muscle testing mm -hmm. to determine what is the thing that's keeping you stuck. Like what is the thing in um, playing in the background in your head mm -hmm. or in your beliefs or in your mind that is keeping you stuck. And the more you uh, bring that to the forefront and then use that as a way to deprogram with the tapping can move you forward in conjunction with uh, physical support of the body. You brought up something there. Maybe you'll be the first one that'll actually explain this to me if you know of it. How does muscle testing work? 
uh, contact care. We got a modality, contact yes. care. And find out more at contactcare.co.nz. Well, how about that? Okay. How does can, uh, muscle testing work? Yeah, this breaks my brain, and then making it remote breaks my brain even more. So, mm-hmm. how does what premise does that work on? Like, I don't understand. I can't grasp. I don't disregard it because obviously people have used it on me, and it's been accurate. But it's it's one of those things that I just don't understand the premise underneath it. There is a book that goes into this. Because people do it on themselves. And I really don't understand how that works. But I've had a couple of of practitioners who've been in the game for 30 years who do clinical work. One of them who wrote a, who just wrote a book on Lyme's disease uh-huh. uh, use muscle testing like right off the bat. And I was basically came at it with like a very combative, reductionist, cynical mind and i was like what if my muscles tired like what if i worked out the, how does this truly give you an accurate gauge because there's so many variables to to uh i guess just um force or electromagnetic strength or you know the veracity of a uh of a signal in your ner- in your nervous system i'm not sure how yeah. how that is premised i got a uh hold on a second called power versus force mm. like that. oh that's right you mentioned this previously maybe, maybe, our, maybe i should uh, read it hold on a second i think you can listen to it as well there's a couple of those types that share the screen i don't understand okay power versus force this is a great oh, yeah wow hardcover born. the hidden oh, hidden determinants of human behavior by dr david hawkins Okay, so that is the book. Um, Interesting. But in terms of, let me stop this. Um, the best way I could describe it is the nervous system is an electrical system. Yes, 100%. So if we're on the same page as the nervous system being an electrical system, there are certain things we can do that can charge up or make the electrical system stronger. And there's certain things that we can do that will determine uh, fuses blown or short circuits in that electrical system. Yep. So when a, a chiropractor who's a kinesiologist will muscle test and they're essentially making a circuit with by touching certain parts of the body to see if the electrical system has a clear circuit. Or okay. connected. Now, does that mean everybody who's testing it, it can't be influenced by a person's right? Uh, the person doing the testing it can't right. be influenced by that. Uh, no, absolutely not. Yeah, people can influence it, and there can be uh, what would be perceived as quacks or, or charlatans or you know people that are. Uh, intentionally manipulating a person's energy yes, and causing the body to go weak in an attempt to sell them something or whatever that is. Uh, this is where tapping into and, and trusting ourselves as far as what we feel um, and getting that more calm baseline because when we're calmer, we can see things more clearly we can uh, perceive things more clearly. We can trust ourselves more. But when we're in that amped up sympathetic state, we can't. Now, everybody I work with at this point, because I mean, I've been doing body work for two and a half decades. Yes. There's a sense, I, there are some people that unless I have a sense of who they are, um, I won't just go to a health fair and let somebody work on me. Right. I just won't go. And unless I have a reference from somebody I trust that I can work with this person or just some questions you can ask people yeah. that know if they're full of shit or not. Yeah. I'm just being. Oh yeah. So practitioner out of the way, 
the premise makes sense to me and but i don't even how can you do that remotely uh, okay right like how does that work <laughs> so it gets into s slightly woo woo sure. but if you break it down it's not so much it's like if i remember i was interviewing somebody on a podcast and they were talking about how remotely you can be influenced mm -hmm. think about getting a fresh juicy yellow lemon mm -hmm. and you start cutting into that lemon and the juice starts oozing out mm -hmm. where you're cutting that lemon and you picture cutting that lemon into a slice and putting it into your mouth and you start biting into it and you feel that that sourness feeling everybody that's listening to this can start getting a sense of uh, what's going on in their mouth their senses can visualize what i'm talking about yes and how it begin they may even begin salivating as a result of thinking about that lemon well we start tapping into the power of our mind and how we could begin to visualize another person we get a sense that that initial snap shot we get in our brain when we think about another person many times is quite accurate mm -hmm. if we're holding a clear place within ourselves and then by visualizing that other person we have uh, people have their own techniques of muscle testing. It could be um, uh, testing with uh, fingers or pendulums or things like that, that will give, um, because we're tuned in to that other person, there's an energetic field yes. that we're connected with. You know, it, it, it gets how our bioenergetic field or our aura can be measured out i think it's 151 feet like yeah had fringes. yeah heart sure. math institute has done a lot of good good research on that and that is what can be measured there is the belief that when we tune into other people or you have uh, mothers and children like the mother knows immediately when something's going on with one of her kids right or you just get that sense it's like well where'd that come from we can go into quantum entanglement from there that yeah that goes a whole bunch of different places sure sure but the the muscle testing comes from that same space i see i'm just holding that intention with that person and then testing a specific way to get what is strong or weak based right. on what is going on so okay. just to poke at that in one more angle i'm assuming from my understanding of what you just described, it would be far more where the most effective and revealing and true if you were in as much of a parasympathetic state as you could be. Is that accurate? Like you want as little resistance around the circuit as possible to be able to see where it is. So if you're adding layers on layers on layers and you're coming from a sympathetic state, which I mean, when I was I was tested, I'm sure I was in, because I automatically didn't believe him. So my defenses already were up, but just how many layers can, do you think that can penetrate through for an accurate test? Like if you're fatigued all over, basically if your neurology is already um, just misfiring all over the place, do you think that can still be an accurate test or is there resistance everywhere? Oh, you you have to be in a clear place okay like the more it, and this is where people get in like psychics yes um and people who are intuitive or psychic or clairvoyant or clairaudient or clairsentient whatever that is yeah. they can speak very knowingly about things however you have to understand that 
they're getting information through a physical vessel right. that has filters, traumas and bias and beliefs and all their, all their stuff that may be resolved or not. Right. They're trying to pass that information along to you and they could be completely full of shit too. Right. But you have to take into consideration uh, and this is knowing yourself the more confident you are in who you are, um, you can take that information with a grain of salt and take it into the equation and use it as a data point. But it doesn't mean you necessarily have to change your course of what you're doing to follow what this person says just because it's coming out of the ethers through them. Right. Okay. That does help. Yeah, because I always wonder, even given the best practitioner, like how many layers of of that can can a simple test like that slice through without any real baselining? It would be one thing if if I had experienced it after a series of amp down strategies, so I was in a a clear and present state. So that that rings true. Yeah, I mean, believe me, I got to that place. So- a lot of screwed up relationships and yeah. situations where it's like you're believing what anyone says. Right. And it's not a good place to be. And that's where you come from this. You got to relax your neurology and start getting as to what um, a baseline it's really a baseline that you begin to establish with yourself so the wheels can touch the ground and you're moving forward. Yes. Um, and my next podcast, I'm actually going to, what we were just talking about with the uh, bioenergetics, resonant fields, biofields, all of those things, we're, I'm going to delve into that because it, it always amazes me when people have such I mean, you do this, uh, you have such good integration in a specific modality that I, you don't even know they're doing it until you start learning about it. And you're like, oh, that's why you do all those things. So I have a, one of my best friends has been doing uh, biogeometry and the structure or the, mm-hmm. the quality of form is the, the technical definition for it. But it's basically working with bioenergetics, pendulums, just fields interacting in that way. And I never understood what or why she did things until I started learning about biogeometry. And I was like, oh, you are a living example of having in something so well integrated that you just display it. And it's only when I start learning about it that I pick all those things up. So I'm very fascinated with that whole subject because as we've been explaining, there's just so many layers to mm-hmm. everything, to the neurology, to pain, to um, motion, and and the energetic unseen level is definitely one of the more hard to grasp because it's unseen, but it's very important and critical. Yeah. Ha- have you noticed anything that, how did you become aware of your, um, your energetics at that level? Which level? Uh, yeah, good point. I, I mean, I guess it could be called neurology, but if neurology is level one, I it's guess all, the, that, that's the piece. It's all neurology, right? The the level before you get into the density, I guess, is the way I would put that. So I can think of neurology as as like a physical. You know, you hit an electric circuit and you send a shock wave. I guess the the energetic would be maybe subatomic, so just a layer below that. Boy using fancy terms. I know, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good. More wave, less particle. How's well, that? There, there's this, there's, my training is in uh, osteopathically based style of body work called orthobionomy. And it starts very physical. Yes. And the more you fine tune and find a position of comfort in the physical body, it gets more energetic. So it's just a different point along a spectrum Mm -hmm. where the more subtle and gentle you get on the physical body, all of a sudden it's like you can 
work with the tension patterns that come off of the physical body in the bioenergetic field to work with the physical body and release physical tension patterns. So it's a gradient that the more you train subtly, physically, in a position of comfort, the more you gain the awareness of how you, you gain a sensitivity and awareness that can be felt off the body as well. When we feel these things, we just don't recognize it. Like everybody feels these things. We talked about it in previous podcasts where it's like the person that's pissed off that walks in the room. You're like, oh, right. You feel that. Those yeah. are energetics. We feel these. We just don't equate it to that. We can feel the person that is just like, oh, wow, I don't know what it is about that person. I just want to go up and talk to them. They feel yeah. like a very comfortable person you can inter interact with. You can see the person that's sad or upset. You can feel that from them. You can yeah. see when a baby cries. We feel that. So we're influenced by all of these things, whether we're aware of it or not. So it's just... How can we go in? I, and I was just thinking about this before you asked the question, mm. the different levels of competence. Oh, there's yeah. unconscious incompetence. Then there's conscious incompetence. Right. And then there's conscious competence. And then there's unconscious competence. It's a progression of we don't know what we don't know until we know it. And then once we know it, we realize how much we don't know until we practice it enough to know that we don't need to know it. <laughs> well put. So, so it, it's like, what skills do you want to cultivate in your neurology? A power lifter is cultivating a skill in their neurology to be able to cr contract their neurology um, in a way that can lift more weight. Yes. You can cultivate your neurology to be more sensitive to be able to feel the energetic patterns off of a physical body. You can cultivate, you know, from a, psych, uh, a mindset or a psycho psychological perspective. All mm -hmm. of these are what do we want to put our focus on? And we can do, we can create, we can cultivate whatever we want. We just need to realize that we're going to do it easier and faster with less resistance, the more of a parasympathetic state we're in than we are if we're trying to push the rock up the hill. If we're fighting it because we have physical pain or we're struggling because we don't know how to regulate our neurology or how to take care of ourselves or, or do self-care that we're trying to do it. It's like anything you try to do from a sympathetic state is going to take you 10 times as long. You're going to struggle a hundred times as much and get very, very little results. The more we can get ourselves into that parasympathetic state and understand our neurology, be it get out of pain or anything else is going to happen in that parasympathetic state. Yeah, that was well put. That's I think that's a good summation of this entire episode, actually. Kind of just <clears throat> working or getting yourself out of the resistance so that you can actually make make progress and not expend all of your energy that way. And so I think what we're going to have to do is create a little bit more structure mm -hmm. so we can yes. uh, get more questions in involved and uh, promote other things, your, your stuff, my stuff. Um, so that there's a little bit, cause we, we like, you like asking questions. I, like I do. <laughs> I just go all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Infinitely curious. So, which is great. Yeah. It just, I, we definitely I, need a little more structure. Now we're, yeah. yeah. Now we're at a uh, hour and 15 minutes. Yep. Well, next week we'll bring a little more structure. Yeah. yeah. And today is tuesday so physical reset circle have you guys started filming yet no we haven't that is just in person we did the first one last week we worked out some 
kinks as far as the promotion of that. So yes, we're doing that through the Sovereignty Lab things, and we're going to have to do um, get it in the banners here. So yes. So for anyone who is listening, um, there is Bill does a. Uh, Tuesday at 4.30, physical reset circle out at Mandala Springs in Barnardsville at the base of uh, Pisgah National Forest, which is teaching you to do everything we've been speaking about. And wherever you're at, basically just help yourself to amp down a little bit so that you can start to feel those subtle changes. And if you're in visceral pain, hopefully start to, to reduce that a little bit, but teach you the modalities of um, how to feel that in your body. Did I describe that accurately? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're doing that, uh, this Saturday, we're going to start, um, that's going to be the 21st of January. We're going to start uh, martial arts training. Ooh, it's the Stama. Stama. Nice. Yeah, which is a healing modality disguised as a martial art. Yes. And I got to witness that, um, with, uh, Rob Linfesti, the owner Mandala and a, a friend of his, you three in the it, Sovereignty Labs. That was interesting to watch mm -hmm. and just a completely different. It, it looked like martial arts, but it was so <clears throat> choreographed isn't the right word. It was so soft, I guess, as in you could tell that the, the that you were trying to um, look for tension patterns. Right. Like there was no winning. It was not a competition. It was a diffusing tension pattern scenario. It was, it was like a dance. It was very interesting to watch. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of people get that confused that it's just all soft. Right. Uh, when you speed that up, when you're right. working with another person's tension pattern and they have intent to hurt you, it, that speeds up very quickly, very easily. And, uh, you end up relaxing your opponent's tension and collapsing their structure because their neurology is too stiff. The physical body is too stiff. Right. I think that's what martial arts bring to the table, right? Is the the balance between sort of the, the resistance training all hard and then the more soft practices is that that balance and catered towards where you are. Yeah, well I I see a majority of the martial arts out there actually assume the person is healthy and they're just going to train. And what ends up happening is you have a lot of these guys and I was involved in judo for quite a long time. And I see a lot of it in the old martial artists that their bodies are breaking down. Right. They're, they're saying, Oh, that's just what happens when I get older. That's just how it is. My, my, knuckles are like this my shoulders like this i need to get my hip replaced got a herniated disc in my back and there's this belief that that is how it's supposed to work and um, their their mindset and their philosophy the words that they're speaking is like judo is the gentle way but in practical application there isn't looking deep enough into understanding how their neurology can feel mm -hmm. without the tension that is built in the physical body as a result of the techniques that are practiced or falling on the ground in the way that they do that actually builds tension in the neurology so you feel more amped up after training than you do before it, it, it's it gets in like we don't know what we don't know yep and until it, like the rock concert we go to the rock concert and the day after we go to the rock concert our ears are ringing and it's hard to hear right. uh, somebody whispering next to us it's because the noise was so loud we don't know how quiet it's hard to hear quiet things until we quiet the neurology enough to be able to understand what we don't know. And most people, like the client I was talking about at the beginning that was so upset because she fell asleep on the table. It's not okay to be that relaxed. Well, you can be that relaxed on a functional level on a daily basis and get more done with a lot less effort 
if you knew how quiet your neurology can get and didn't judge it in the process. Right. <clears throat> That's a good way to end this. Yep. Okay. Don't, don't yeah, judge it. We're going to turn into another. <laughs> yes. Yeah, another. Well, we'll save that for next week. But yeah. uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. And uh, next week we'll bring more more structure, but I'm sure I'll still end up taking it all That's over the place. We well, touched on energetics. We got inflammation. We got uh, modalities to slowly bring back in the parasympathetic. So um, we will hone in on a couple of those next week. Awesome. Well, right, thanks, Bill. thank you, Alex. Thanks everybody for being here. Take care.